Hello, welcome back to my YouTube channel to the free Linux tutorials, videos, PDF notes, virtual box appliances, etc. There are my unique selling points. Oh, I'm not going to go through all that, but Ubuntu has now joined Mint and CentOS as a VM you can download if you want to. There are the PDF notes and I've uh, done another ad hoc video, we covered the lost password and today we're looking at section 6 of the Linux command line for beginners and Windows users find and job control I'll change workspaces to workspace 1 and here I've got running mint 20 in with a snapshot in VirtualBox, and there are the files with well, I was going to say the 13 files, a directory is a file as well that we've been using. Well, I've got the desktop too, so it makes 14. I've also got open the PDF notes that go with this. Press the right buttons, there we go. So, this is the command line for beginners, Windows users. So I'm Ken Ma. Please like, comment and subscribe on YouTube. And this is section six, finding files and job control. And there are links to iStrive, to Dropbox, to DigitalOcean, uh, all of which I've mentioned before, and to buy me a coffee. And in this section, finding files and job control, the objectives are at the end of the section, you will be able to find files on the system and execute commands on the files files you find. Redirect output. We did redirect the output. We didn't do redirecting errors. So we look at redirecting error messages. Run and stop background processes. Schedule jobs to run uh, at a given time using the cron tab. And display partitions. Monitor space. And there's other bits and pieces in here. Can't put everything in the title. So it starts with finding files. Let's make that a bit bigger. There we go. I can see it then. So find may be used to find a file by name. You can also find a file by size, by modified date, uh, by owner, by permissions, all, all sorts of things, as we'll see later. Uh, but it's a bit different to other commands in that it takes its uh, parameters are, are words, mostly prefix by hyphen. What you give find first is a start point. So you tell it where to start looking. Come on. So there I could search the whole file system if I put root. I could search a directory like etc or home if I had an idea where the file I was looking for was. Or I could search home in another way by using dot dot because it's a directory above where I am. Or I can search the current directory by just putting a dot. So the simplest example of find is find in the current directory. The file name is nice. And when you say print, a lot of times when you say print on Linux, it means display on the screen. That will find that file if it exists. And also if it exists in any subdirectories and print it to the screen. So nice is there. Now I could do it again and specify a directory like home and I'll get more occurrences of nice because nice exists in train X, train A and train 1 and train 2 as well. So there are five occurrences of nice there. Um, but you also get errors. A lot of the time when you're searching with find you'll get errors because there are many directories that you don't have permissions to look in. So you get permissions denied. So don't be surprised if you get errors. And of course using home is exactly the same as using dot dot. And minus print is the default. So I could have done that like that. One other simple thing you can do when you found the file is you can use minus ls to print out details about the file. So there's the uh, the size of the file, etc. You know the permissions, who owns it, what group it's in. 
date and time updated. So that's finding a simple form. Now, we did redirection in an earlier section, and we know from redirection that we could redirect the output from this. So if, for instance, I was looking for those files, on the end here I could put, you don't need the spaces, but I put them in to make it clearer. I could put a file name, like plist. Now the way this works is in channels. Standard input is zero, standard output is one, and standard error is two. Oh, brilliant. Sorry, that's my alarm clock to tell me the washing machine needs fixing. Well, not fixing, these seem to. I'll do it in a minute. And standard error, which is two. Um, I want standard output, so I could, as I've done in the example there, in the notes, put a one before the greater than, like that. But the point is, one is the default. So rather than doing that, most people, when they're using standard output, just put greater than. The standard output would go there. The point is, if you're using standard input, you need to use a zero. Uh, more importantly, probably, or more useful, is that you need to put a two if you're using standard errors. We'll look at that over the page. So, if I go back here, I could redirect the output here to plist using one greater than. Now, usually in the classroom, I ask a question now, what's going up on the screen? What's going to come up on the screen if I redirect the output? And a lot of people think nothing. But the answer is, what you see is the errors, because the only thing it's redirected is the output. And that's exactly the same as if I ran it without the one, like that. I would get the same. Not like that. You need a space. You don't need a space there. <laughs> Otherwise it... No, no, of course you don't. Sorry. What am I talking about? That's fine. You can put spaces there if you want to. The errors come up on the screen, plist comes up, if I catch it, with the files. Now errors we handle with two greater than, and errors are over the page. So what happens with errors is, that's better, be careful what I put in there by accident. If I type things in there, sometimes it reformats the output. Let's go back up here. If I want to redirect the errors here, actually I don't want an ls, do I? The examples in the notes don't do ls, they do it like that. And then cat plist. It doesn't make any difference, it's just you get different things in the output. So that's the example that's in the notes um, back over the page, I beg your pardon. Not having a good day today, am I? So dot dot minus name, nice B list. Now, if we want to write redirect the errors, what we do, as well as redirecting the output, we can also say two greater than. See, now you can put a one there, but as it's a default, most people leave it out. But if you want to redirect the errors, you have to put a two. So there I could say, error. Now nothing comes up on the screen. The output goes to plist just as it did. Every time you use a greater than, if the file exists, it's overwritten. If it, uh, if it doesn't exist, it's created. So plist each time is being overwritten. Um, the errors are in pera. So there's the example there. Uh, with two greater than. Now a lot of the time you don't want the errors. So you can throw the errors away. And the way you do that is you put them in a black hole called slash dev slash null. Not nev dull as somebody typed on the course, I remember. That throws the errors away. And of course the output is still in plist. And in fact, if you want to, what you can do is to get up on the screen 
the list of files is running like that don't redirect the output just redirect the errors and then you get the list of files so there's dev null throwing things away the other thing you can do you can send both output and errors to the same file using two greater than ampersand one if you redirect the output or one greater than ampersand two if you redirect the errors so to do that here I would redirect the output and the errors would go to ampersand one sorry I mistyped that it really isn't my day is it Amazon one and then if I cat p list I've got both output and errors now there's an exercise there you can try and uh, if you pause the video try the exercise come back and have a look at the answers what I usually do just to um, break it up on the screen or perhaps so you can find it if you're looking for it let's just run that a couple of times here are the answers at the bottom of the screen so the first one it says find all the currencies of the file password parent directory so you go up into your parent directory files name password it doesn't say anything about redirection so that will just print them on the screen the second one says find all occurrences under root again files named password but this time redirect the output to a file and the errors to another file there are the answers down here bottom of the screen there's number two because you see nothing on the screen this time but the files found are in p file and the errors quite a lot of them are in p error because what happens if you don't redirect the errors and you try and find the files like this is you get a lot of errors on the screen the file names are there somewhere mixed in with the errors are much harder to find unless you redirect the errors it's, it's better to redirect the errors oh, excuse me the last one is find under root the file named ifconfig discarding any errors That will throw the errors away. I think that file only exists in one place. There it is, it's in SBIN. Now, they can do other things with uh, with find. So for instance, let me close that for now and take this back down a bit. Presumably I can, there we go. Um, you can find multiple files now we did the other day that if you use an asterisk like LSP asterisk it expands to be all the files that begin with a P in my current directory so I've got password people P error P file uh, and P list so you'd think wouldn't you that I could say find in my current directory the files that begin with a P like that well you would think that but of course that doesn't work and the reason why it doesn't you can see why it doesn't work if you turn on one of the debugging options set minus x you see these options if you say if you type set minus o set minus x down here is x trace so if i set x trace on with minus x and then I run that find command again 
you can see that the find is expanded. It shows you your expanded command and it passes all the file names into find where well, you're only allowed one file name so it doesn't work but it's a simple way around that quite often when you use a quote sorry an asterisk on the command line you have to quote it with an asterisk it usually doesn't matter double quotes or single quotes and it will work and you'll see that now it finds p file p error p list but it also finds all the files beginning with p in my subdirectories like the dot cache directory uh, dot whatever that is directory the cinnamon directory and all these files that begin with p in the scr directory and like i said you can do it i usually use double quotes uh, unless i have a reason to use single quotes which you do sometimes single quotes gives you the same thing and to turn this off so it doesn't come up because now it will come up with every command for instance if I do an ls it tells me that I'm using an alias to minus minus color equals auto you turn it off with set plus x um, you can find files with mixed case names um, like this the square brackets if you remember is either or so if I do square bracket B or a B sorry square bracket a Y or a Y and square bracket an E or E and then follow it with an asterisk it will find any file um, that begins with BYE with any spelling I need to double quote there there we go those two oh, I didn't do set plus X did I to turn it off uh, you can try that um, it'll just come up with the same thing it's not really an exercise it's more what I've just done over the page um, as well as the minus print options there are several other options with find including minus exec which is there and minus ok which is there and here's a couple of simple examples of using those I could find all the files in my current user named password and execute a command on them now if you pipe something into WC minus L it counts how many lines there are in the file the syntax with find is very specific so that says starting in the current directory look for files name password execute WC minus L and then you need open and close curly brackets a backslash and a semicolon and it counts how many lines there are in the two password files that we have in this directory if you don't do it properly exactly like that put a space in there for instance it doesn't work if you don't escape the semicolon it doesn't work I don't really know how it works but I've always thought that what it did um, was it made up two commands the find command and the WC minus L command that combined them together hence the semicolon and that it put the file name that you find the password file there in WC minus L somehow but it does work now you can make an interactive find by using OK so suppose I want to remove all the files here that begin well some of the files that begin with a P I can say find here files named and then ones that start with a P so P asterisk and rather than exec this time I say minus OK because I want to prompt is this OK yes or no I'm going to remove the file curly braces backslash semicolon so this will find files that begin with a P but not only in my current directory 
it's files that begin with a P in any directory below where I am. Now if I don't want, I could type no, but if you just press return, uh, it won't delete it. So the one I just created, P file, I'll get rid of that. I'll get rid of P error. I don't want to get rid of that. I'll get rid of P list, but I'll keep password and people and any of the others that it finds as it goes down. All the files in SCR. When I get to the bottom there and clear and do an LS, it's removed the files that I just created while I was running find. And again, that isn't really an example, an exercise. Try some examples of using minus exec and minus OK yourself. Now, people sometimes ask me things on courses, uh, which I incorporate in the notes. So a guy came and he said, why can't we just say when we're counting lines in the password file, find files named password in the current directory and pipe that into wc minus l. Well, the reason is it doesn't work. It comes back with two. There are two files. Whoops. Password and password. And the reason you get a two is, is because it passes each file in there and counts them. So it counts two files. It doesn't pass them as individual file names. You can get it to pass individual file names though, though, if you pipe it into XARGs. That's what XARGs does. It takes its input, um, rather than being a count of two, as being two individual file names, and it comes back with the number of lines in each file. In fact, if we go up a level and put two dots and then over here, we throw away the errors. We can find lots of files called password and count how many lines there are in those files. There it is there, that command. Whoops. There. So as it says here, IXRs passes each individual file name found to the WC command. And you use it with a pipe like that. It's a neat command. It's in the notes because this guy came on the course and asked another guy came on the course and asked me what XARGs did. So I came up with that example. Sorry, I was trying to change pages there, but if Vince, um, this is what I'm using to read the PDF, got itself stuck in, um, well, out not in continuous mode, so it wasn't showing page after page. I know how I did that with some keystroke, probably. Now, let's look at foreground and background jobs over the page. If you run a find, supposing you find something, right, the IF config one we did. So if I go back to, I can find that with Control and R to do a reverse search. Type in IF config, there it is. That sort of command can take a long time. It didn't take a long time on here. But on a big server, it might take a long time. And if you run it like that, it um, means you can't do anything else while it's going on. Simple examples here is SCR follow. To the script I think I showed you earlier. If I didn't, we'll do it now. I think I did when we were looking at tail. Um, if I run SCR follow, this is a foreground job. Whoops, which won't work like that. It works like that. Um, it doesn't work like that either. It used to be in slash SCR. It's in SCR now. Now what that does, uh, it waits five seconds and then it produces in another file, it counts um, what it's doing. So I've opened another tab here, file new tab, whoops. 
what it's created is if you remember it's a file called follow me and if you tail follow me it's just counting and if you tail it with minus f which is in the notes further down the page you can follow it so you can see it counting it just counts every second or so it means to an end really from back into that control and scene if we go back to the original terminal the way you get out of this is to use control and c unless it finishes you know if it's a real job you want it to run one way out of it is control and c what i could have done was made it a background job by putting an ampersand after it there are several ways of running jobs in background rather than in foreground and this is one so if i say scr follow and put an ampersand it runs in background and it allows me to run jobs in foreground let's follow me um, i could even put in here the tail minus f follow me what's she running there till i stop and i can run ps and there's my job following the little sleep job was started by follow because it did a sleep for five seconds before it started and you can do this for lots of jobs um there's a couple of silly ones x clock whoops x clock if you can spell um, gives you a clock need a bigger screen really but it'll um, well manage what we'll do is we'll shrink this a bit um, and then we'll put the clock up there and we'll have our screen down here um, the other one I like is X eyes What XIs does is follow the cursor around the screen. Actually, there's a better one than that. <coughs> Onico. Onico is a little cat who chases the mouse, which is the cursor. If he catches it, much like my cats, he tends to kill it. Perhaps eat it. And off he goes again whereas the eyes are watching the mouse go around the cat is chasing them now the cat there is a foreground job he'll probably come over here if i come over here it says here run some of these things so you've got some background jobs running can't get out he's stuck inside <laughs> i didn't think of that never mind uh what we're going to do is looking at um, starting and stopping jobs let's uh, let's kill him for a minute we'll bring him back in a minute there he's gone so like it says here um, run some background jobs so you've got some background jobs going so if you do a PS you can see things like follow X clock X size sleep um, the bash is the shell you're running and the PS is the PS command that I just ran And what we'll do here is look at stopping jobs. Now you stop jobs generally uh, if they get stuck for some reason or they get out of control or you don't want them anymore uh, using the kill command. You do kill the process ID. So the process ID is the number there. So if I kill 2668 and do a PS, that job's been terminated along with the sleep which follow started I could also kill the clock and excise if I wanted to so 2701 and 2725 and they're both gone now I do a PS I've got nothing running you can kill multiple jobs specifying n1 n2 n3 n4 i mean that can be a pain if you've got lots of jobs you want to kill i think there is a kill all um 
the kill all command, but that's a bit um, that's a bit over the top, so I don't use that. I think that's for administrators. Uh, what I do is make up my own using a combination of PS, a pipe, and a walk. I'll show you how that works. If I set some jobs going in background, now they're all the same job, but it doesn't matter. It's a means to an end here. The PS, right? I want rid of all those jobs. What I could do is if I pipe PS into AWK, which is a utility, quite a complex utility for processing text files. There it is there. You can produce little reports with totals and all sorts of things. And I cover it on my shell scripting course. And what AWK does, it sees its input as a set of fields labeled $1, $2, $3, $4, counting from the left. The syntax is a bit fiddly. You need to tell it to print fields in curly braces in single brackets, but $1 is this field because its delimiter for the fields is a space. So if I do a PS and pipe that into AWK, that's going to give me a list of PID numbers, apart from the front one, PID. So this is, as it says in the notes, is, a, is an ungainly way of doing this, but it does work. So to actually remove them, what I do is I run that command. If you remember, if you put a command in dollar brackets, you can sort of embed it in another command like echo, or in this case, kill. So if I say kill now, it's going to kill all those PID numbers. Admittedly, it can't call kill PID, and the other ones, well, like I said, it's an ungainly way of doing it, but it does kill everything off. There it is there. Now over the page, we'll look at job control because you can do more with these jobs um, in background. Just hang on a minute. Now I said earlier, there are various ways of putting jobs into background. One is to use the ampersand at the end of the of the job name, like that. Uh, you can also use the cron tab for scheduling jobs to run overnight on a timer or regular jobs. You can use something called at to run one-off jobs and you can also use job control to play about with jobs. Um, that's what we're going to look at here. Uh, but the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to show you a different desktop for Mint here. This is something called Openbox. It's very minimalist as you'll see and the reason I use it is because I like to show people X-Penguins running. So what it says here, using job control commands running in foreground can be suspended and can be moved from foreground to background and back again and started and suspending again. It's very clever. But to do that, what we're going to do is log out and log in again to Mint or CentOS using Openbox. So to log out of Mint, down here, and click Log Out and Log Out. Now when you log back in, there's a box there which gives you an option of the default Cinnamon environment. Um, I'm not sure what software rendering does. Or Openbox. So you have a choice because I installed Openbox as well as Cinnamon. You have a choice of two desktops. So choose Openbox and then log back in again. And like I said, this is a minimalist environment. So don't expect to see anything appear on the screen. To get things up and running, what you do is you right click. A lot of people like this because it saves resources, but for my mind, you might as well have a desktop you can look at. But X Penguins won't run in other desktops like GNOME and Cinnamon, but it does run in Openbox. So if I right click on the desktop, I can choose a terminal emulator, and there I am in the terminal. 
and in here I mean everything else is exactly the same I can actually you could probably change the colors so it's not white on black but we're not going to be here for long so I won't bother I can run SCR follow again with an ampersand there it goes one that's not in the notes that I'm going to run is Onico the little mouse I'm going to run him in background this time so there she is running around the screen chasing the cursor getting all upset if I move it over here and my favorite X penguins um, it says over here run X penguins in foreground so we will we'll run X penguins in foreground like that there they go it's that jolly now this might seem daft but it's a means to an end it's to illustrate a point I can suspend the foreground job which is at penguins here by typing control and Z and you can see it's suspended because the penguins stop running about the cat's still chasing the cursor but the cat's in background so I've now got follow running Oniko, which is a little cat, maybe he's Japanese, X Penguins, and Sleep, which was kicked out by Follow. Now, another way of looking at these is to type jobs. And what you'll see from the jobs command is that X Penguins is not running. It's a stop job because I suspended it with Control and Z. It stopped in background. The other jobs which were run with the ampersand on the end are happily running now now what you can do is manipulate these jobs so for instance a suspended job in background but can be restarted with the bg command so if i say bg3 that will restart the penguins and a job that's running there can be brought back into foreground with FG so if I say FG2 the little cat comes back into foreground still chasing the cursor and I can suspend her with control and Z and she stops now in background I've got penguins running and Onico stops follows still carrying on and you can move jobs in and out as you want like this so it's not really an exercise again but you could try starting the SKR follow script as a foreground job and then suspend it you can type other jobs if you haven't got S penguins you could try X clocks and X eyes uh, if you haven't got Onico any job that you think might run sleep you know if you can't do anything else Try manipulating the jobs using FG and BG and display the PID number of the SCR follow job and then terminate the job. And before you do that, when you've done the exercise, what you might want to do is log out. Now if I close the window here, I can right click and exit and exit again. The trick here is though, don't log in back in straight away because the default is the last one used. So I think it will come back in as open box. We want to go back in as cinnamon. And then we're back in again. So try the exercise. Like I said, there's no solution really. It's just for you to try out the commands and then we'll have a look at scheduling jobs using the cron tab I'm just going to uh, open the terminal here make it a bit bigger and then suspend before I start again the next section we look at is scheduling jobs if you're going to run a job uh, on a regular basis or more than once then the cron tab is the best way to do it the cron is a daemon that runs in background let's turn the highlights on 
So we can find it with PS minus EF piped into grep grom. We'll look at grep in the next section. What it does, it finds particular, well in its simplest form, finds particular text in its input. Like I said, we'll look at that in a moment. Well, in the next section. So there's the cron there. So provided the cron's running and you've got permissions, you can use it. And what it does, it schedules commands and it puts a file with your username in var spool cron. Now you do this by creating a file using a command called crontab. You don't edit the files with nano or vi. You create them with crontab and the files have temporary file names so you can't actually edit the real file. Now the entries in the cron um, consist of six fields. The first one there's a comment because it begins with a hash. The six fields are the minute from the left, the hour, the day of the month, the month, the weekday, so those are the first five, and then the command to be run. Use the 24 hour clock, so 8 for 8 a.m., 20 for 8 p.m. The first five fields are numeric, although they can contain um, special characters like comma, hyphen, and slash. The final field contains a command, and what you put there, don't put scr slash backup sh, it won't know where it is. You put full path names so that it finds things. Figlet it will find because that's a system command. But if it's one of your scripts, you need to give it a full path name normally. Now these jobs here are described below. So the first uh, where we are the first job displays a message on the half hour. If you put an asterisk it's every hour every day of the month, every month, every weekday. The second one takes a backup every 30 minutes. So on the hour and the half hour between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. but only on days one and five, which is Monday and Friday. The next one at 4 a.m. in the morning every month or every day of the month for every month um, every day because that's one hyphen five so that will be Monday to Friday that will take a backup and the last one at 8.30 in the evening on the 10th day of the month that runs a monthly update it's very flexible um, as it says there, the cron daemon often used to schedule regular system backups, which may be run at night when the system is lightly loaded. Um, there are lots of options. Here's a simple one. How do you run something every five minutes? You put asterisk slash five, and that will run every five minutes. Now, if access to the cron is allowed, existing entries in the cron tab may be viewed and edited or added using the crontag command. So I'll run through how you use it. Then there's an, uh, an exercise. You follow me if you want to or do the exercise afterwards. So start with crontab minus L. And if you haven't got the entries, oh, you're going to be able to spell crontab minus L. There we are. There's no crontab for me. Now by default, if you use the crontab, uh, it will use Vi as the editor. If you want to use Nano as the editor, what you need to do is export, which makes a variable, in this case, available to subshells, the variable editor in uppercase and set it to Nano. And if you want that to stay there for every time you log in or open the terminal, remember, put it in dot bash rc but for now I'm just going to type it the command line so I've set my editor to nano having done that um, you can get an empty file by doing crontab minus e 
which is one way well you don't get an empty file you get a load of comments it says edit this file to introduce tasks to be run by the cron la -de -la -de -la. I'm not going to read all that but it sort of explains what I've explained to you uh, points out over here the cron tab file is never edited directly but always using the cron tab command now I don't do it that way if I come out of here with control and X what I've got in SCR there's a sample file called cron file and what this does is every 45 minutes it echoes or oh, there's a figlet of tea break out to PTS1 at 9.15 it runs figlet good morning out to PTS1 and on the hour and a half hour between 9 and 4 days 1 to 5 Monday to Friday it runs a script in train 1 so what I normally do is submit that to the cron now you do that like this cron tab the name of the file so rather than typing all that in I'm going to go cron tab that file name and then do cron tab minus e and there are my entries so it depends what the time is I've got a second terminal open here I suppose you could open the clock actually that's yeah, clock uh, logged in as root if I check on here the date is it's the 1st of November and it's 8.18 in the morning TTY this is PTS1 so back here if I add on a couple of minutes so if I change that to 8.20 uh, it should say tea break out to PTS1 when it runs I'm not going to run the other two. Oops. Being in Vi there, that's a Vi command for dealing in the line. Here, if you want to cut text, it's Control and K. So the time is. Oops. Uh, that's a bit close, isn't it? So we'll make that A21. And then we'll save that with Control and X. Yes. And return. And we can check the date in here. And if we do a cron tab minus L now. That's the cron tab that's going to run. So that will run. And hopefully display the message T break on this terminal fifty seconds to go right. when you've finished with the cron tab uh, you might want to remove it you do that with cron tab minus r and in a moment we're going to look at the command line mail command and uh, Nobody, I don't think, right? Well, prob probably some people do, some Luddites. Um, you can send mail from the command line, but most people use a GUI tool. I use online mail, I've used that for years. Um, one reason for using the command line mail is that if you get an error, quite often Linux will email you a message telling you about the error. And I can show you that by altering my cron doesn't run yet no there it is there's tea break popped up on the other terminal now if I alter my cron um, let's check the time it's 821 so if we go for 823 so if I do cron tab minus e again and I change that to 823 um, and along here it's very easy to forget to put the redirection in like that save that troll and x yes return the cron doesn't validate what's in there it's up to you to get it right 
So that is going to run at in two minutes. So we'll move on and we'll look at over the page um, the exercise and then I think the mail command. So if you want to try what I've just done there, this runs through the same thing. So check the date and use TTY to find out what terminal you're going to write to. Um, submit the cron, set the editor, edit the cron and schedule a job to display a message on your current terminal or on the second terminal every hour. Um, if you want you can save your cron tab entries in the file. So if you've got several entries there, I mean I've only got one but it doesn't matter, I can save that in the file using redirection. So I can redirect that to my own cron file. That's here. And then you remove the cron tab. Uh, I once ran a course on a Friday we were doing the cron file. There were 10 graduates on this course and they all set up the cron tab to display little messages on their screen and then we went home. When we came in on Monday morning, nobody could log in to the server because the screens, you know, all the terminals they were writing to had been shut down. They'd gone home. Uh, so it was emailing and some of them put in every five minutes. So there were hundreds of emails saying they hadn't worked. So it's best to remove the cron if you finish with it. You can do that with cron tab minus R. And then cron tab minus L will show you that it's not there. But of course you can put it back by just doing cron tab cron file and then cron tab minus L will put it back again. Also at the end of this section there is a page or two pages of cron tab examples. Now let's see what that's done. Didn't display another message. Now if we go over here and look at mail, if it's set up properly, which I don't think it's set up on the Ubuntu VM yet, the one that's there now, uh, but it should work for CentOS and Mint. You can look at your mail by just typing mail. Uh, there's also mail X as a command. Right, so I've got four pieces of mail. Now the first one, wait, look at the first, they're unread, which is the U to the left. They're numbered, so if I type a one, I can see the first one, which just says, welcome to this Linux course. Number two and number three were just files. Um, there we go. I can get the headers back by typing an H. So I've read the first three and there's the cron demon one. So if I run four, it says somewhere that it's an error. Yes, that's what I was trying to do. And it's come out on here. So that could be useful if your cron doesn't work. Um, like I said, get the heads back. Again, if you don't want the email, so if I get rid of four, I can just say D4. And that the headers is deleted. Uh, use a question mark think to get help uh, no probably not it's not what I wanted now there it must be an H it can't be an H can it it's got to be a question mark I suppose that is help I just didn't expect it to look like that um, what else if you've got unread mail uh, or mail that's been read even when you quit what it does, no it's red mail actually, quit with Q, it will save messages in your mailbox. So you get a new file called mbox, there it is. Now if you go back in the mail again, you haven't got any mail. To open your mailbox you use minus F for the file name, mbox, and there's your saved mail. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail. Uh, but like I said, it's a fully fledged mail system that you can use for the command line, but it's really useful if you're using the cron tab and things go wrong. 
quit from there. Back to the beginning. There we go. And we will move on and look at my nodes. Now every object that's um, files and directories and other things, like printers I suppose, disks, are represented by an inode. An inode is a data structure that stores basic information about the file, directory or other file. So each and every file under Linux has the following attributes. You can see them actually over here if you do ls i. And the inodes are just numbers. It points to a portion at the beginning of the disk where inodes are stored to a particular inode for each file, directory or other file. And it stores the type of the file, the permissions, the sorts of things you see if you do an ls minus l, um, some of which we haven't covered yet. So permissions, links, which is this one, which we'll cover soon. Uh, the owner, the group, the file size, um, the file access date and modification time, um, file deletion time if it's being deleted, the number of links, soft or hard, we're going to look at that in a moment, extended attributes such as append only or cannot be deleted, and you can have special permissions called access control lists. Now all the above information is stored in an inode and it identifies the file and all its attributes. So when you cat a file, so if I type cat by, it's got nothing in it really. What it does, uh, Linux, it finds by, it looks in the directory. All that's in directories is file names and inodes, nothing else, there's no data in there. So it finds by there, finds the inode number, and goes off to the disk to find the inode and gets all the information about the file including the size of the file and where the data starts and then it can go away and display the data. Um, you can find out information about a particular file with the stat command. So there is the inode for by how many blocks it is the block size it's a regular file etc um, and you can find files <laughs> using the find command by inode so if you wanted to find that particular file you could say find we'll start looking in this directory um, it's a file so we could say the type is a file and the inum is 552838 um, and in fact if you wanted to delete it you can put minus delete on the end that's another option to the find command but that's or dangerous because you're deleting files perhaps you should look at the file first before you delete it oh, that's gone I can get it back of course because I've got a backup if I go up into home down into train one there's a file there called by copy into my current working directory with dot and I've got the file back so don't go messing about deleting things. Well, it doesn't matter with these files. Unless you know you've got a backup, you can get them back again. Now I said I'd mention links for files. These, oh, let's do it this way. These are the number of links that a file has. And by default, when you create a file, most they'll have one link. Although directories always have two links, so that's directory. In fact, that directory's got four links. Interesting. And that one's got two links. Um, you can create links using the ln command.
Sorry, I just had a pause there because I spotted an error in the notes. The uh, slash in front of the file was missing there. So here are some simple examples of creating a link. Suppose you often need to look at, using the less command, the syslog file, which is in var log syslog. Now, you can create a link to that using ln. So you say ln var log syslog and give it a name, like log. Now, it depends. Again, there's an error in the notes there, but it's instructive. Um, I'll fix it. Uh, and we'll come back. Just give me a second. Okay. I'll just fix that um, on the fly. It's easier than re-recording things. I mean, it's hard work doing that. Uh, the reason it failed was I didn't put the minus S there. There'll be a minus S in your copy. There wasn't in mine just now. And you need the minus S because uh, you can't create a hard link unless... The file is on the same partition um, as the link you're creating. So if you think about it, if I do a df here, actually let's uh, do a df minus h, get it human readable. Um, they're on SDA5. But it's not permitted to create um, a soft link like that so what you do is hard link so what we need to do is put minus s there now we do an ls minus l we've got a new file called log there which is a link which points to var log syslog and if you want to look at the log file, we can just say less log. That's one use of links. You can also create links to other files, um, soft links to files which are on your, in the, you know, in the same realm where you are. So for instance, here I could link and go up into train A can't spell a and then gold file and in here I'll call it old file a oh I've just remembered why you get this error if you're doing this in CentOS that will work um, but if you're doing this here you're not allowed to do it unless you use sudo And then it works. And what you get in this case is our link there. So that file in my user is owned by train A, is in the group users, and it's called old file A. So it's not my file, but I can look at it. And it's the file for train one. So it says here, oh God, why don't you read the notes, Ken? It says here in Ubuntu and Mint, you have to use sudo or root permissions may be required to run this command, it says. So you go. So this creates a hard link to the old file one owned by user train A. The number of links that a file has you can view with ls minus l. So this file now has two links. This one and the one in train A. Now, if we switch into train A, I'm opening root here. But um, if you want to do this, let's, let's come out of there. Um, and out of there. Okay, you could go to file, open a new tab. And in this tab, su minus train A. The 
password is X. Here we are in train A, do an ls minus L. And there's the file, old file, which has now got two links. Now if someone else creates a link to it, so in fact I can open another tab. And here I'm going to switch into train X. And I'm going to link to dot dot slash train a slash old file and call it old a. So the file name, you make up your own file names for these links. Again, I need to use sudo to do that. The password for train x, who does have sudo permissions, I think. Yes. And then an ls minus l. And there's the link to old file called old a. And now it's got three links. One from train x, one from train a. If I go back to my user and do an ls minus l again, in here it's got three links. So there I'm in uh, here I'm in train A. So if I'm in train A, I can edit old file. So if I do vi old file, yank the first line, yy, and copy it a few times with p. Save the file with colon x. No, 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 we've done something wrong here, haven't we? Let's come out of there and think about what we've done wrong. I'm not sure why that is, but it wants us to override it. We can override that by doing W exclamation mark. That will write it away and then a Q to quit. Now we're in train A, if we cat old file, it's got multiple lines. Go back into train, well into KDM here, where I've got the file. The file, old file, which has, I'm sorry, old file A, <laughs> which has the three links here if I cat it. now has multiple entries. Same if I go to train x um, where I can do an ls minus l. Here I called it old a. If I cat old a and um, these files can be removed. Oh no it's not removed though actually because you might want to know if you're train a you might want to know where the links are to your file and you can do that with the find command train a can say find go up a level look for the inum for that file now let's do an ls minus i first find its inum we could have used stat but there is old file so it's 659621 there so here we do find, go up into home, minus i num, 659621, 659.621, uh, and throw the errors away. Into dev null. And there are the three files. So old A, old file A, and old file are in effect the same file. And it's interesting in that if um, in train A we remove old file. Permission denied, right? Permission denied. There's a 
there's something weird going on here. It's supposed to be our file. Why can't we remove it? I don't know, I'll worry about that in a minute. Uh, we'll get rid of it anyway by cheating and doing sudo remove old file. That probably explains why the edit didn't work properly. Um, Oh, train A doesn't have sudo permissions. Hmm. So it would seem that train A can't remove his own files, which is odd. Uh, if we do an ls, let's try and remove another one. PYE. No, he can't. Now, I've been thinking why this might be, because if we do an ls minus L, he does have right permissions on his files, but if you do an ls minus ld dot, which looks at the train a directory in home, it's owned by my user and in my group, which is wrong. And that's why he can't delete them. So what we'll do, we'll switch into root, which I've done here, change into home, and do an ls minus l and you'll see that all these directories are owned by me um, it's probably the way I set them up uh, but we can change that if you're in root you can change you can do change ownership so I want train one to be owned by train one to be in the group users train one and now if I do an ls minus l that's better and we also want that for train two train a you don't need to do this I'll post a new um, image before I post this video and the new image will be right um, while I'm in here actually I won't bother with the other two it doesn't matter about them um, that's better now let's go back to train A here um, check where we are with ID Yes, we're in train A. Can't clear the screen. Do an ls minus L. And we were trying to remove old file, which had three links, if you remember. Um, you could argue that I should fix all this stuff and redo the video. Well, one thing, that's hard work. But the reason I don't do it is this sort of thing is instructive things go wrong when I run a course in the classroom and things go wrong I set about fixing them I can't rerun the classroom course so what you're getting here is the equivalent of going on a training course in the classroom <laughs> which doesn't happen now especially since we've just gone into another four week lockdown um, there it's gone now if I go back to my user in here exit from root and do an ls minus l you might think that my link's gone but it's not it's still there owned by train a but the link count's gone down to two it will still exist in train x as well uh, with a so stop doing that with a link of two on old a and if i remove all day uh, which I don't own because it's owned by train A but it's a link so I can remove it if I say yes just give me a warning it will be gone gone from there all day and if I, if I go back into my user where it did have two links 
and I do an ls minus l it's now got one link and I can look at the file um, cat old file a so the file point is the file doesn't disappear until you delete it and all its links and I don't own it so I get a prompt but there it's gone and that's linking files I hope that was instructive it was for me I shall have to look at how I set up I set up um, train 1, train 2, train A and train X using a script and I think the problem was I ran the script using sudo logged in as my user KDM and uh, obviously I should have run the script as root my right, linking directories next uh, the default type of link created by the ln command is a hard link you can't use a hard link on directories what you have to do is a symbolic or a soft link using the minus s option like we did in the previous example actually because you can do soft links on files as well so here I'm going to um, look at train a and train a has a directory called temp I can create a link to that by saying ln to dot dot slash train a slash temp and call it something like temp a temp one in this case can't do a hard link so you put there minus s and you do a soft link and you get one of these I saw it described as an open door so there is a pointer to train a temp so if I do an ls on temp1 I'm actually looking at train a's temp1 so a little exercise there no solution for this create your own link to a file owned by train a um, check the original link file of the same contents and create and test the link to a directory which is very simple you can try that and we'll move on and look at write and message oh this is fun it is possible to write to other users who are logged on or even your own user actually <coughs> it's a bit boring um, but we've only got one user logged on here these scratching noises by the microphone that's the cat uh, so what I did I thought I'd show you how to connect to your virtual box using SSH from somewhere else from Windows for instance now one of the problems is that by default the devices that we set up under network use what's called NAT now, if you use NAT what it does it picks up the IP address from the host machine so I can get out to the internet very easily because I'm using the same IP address as my laptop now if I change that to bridged I can pick up my own individual IP address now what you need to do having changed that is log in as root at the moment the cat's eating my hair because he wants me to feed him sorry so her she wants me to feed her so I might have to just stop there it's one of the joys of working at home and having feline co-workers we've actually got five cats because my wife brought home a rescued cat she well kitten she was only about one who supposedly been spayed but hadn't and she promptly had four kittens 
one poor little thing died but we kept three so we've now got because we already had another cat so we've now got five cats anyway they're happy now they're all eating away so here we are in route all I have to do is remember what I was doing um, I know I changed the device didn't I to bridge right having changed the device to bridge you can find your IP address by logging his route and doing IP space A now if it comes up oh there it is there actually that I think is my real IP address so in order to show you how you can write to people logged on somewhere else what I'm going to use is something called putty which is this SSH client and over here I've got I'll show you how putty works in a minute um, actually I'll show you how putty works now what you do is you take your IP address that you want to get to put it in putty and save that with the name so in there um, in there I'm going to connect to mint I'm going to save that you can get putty from putty.org here and download it and you can download it for Windows and for Linux um, you can also SSH if I opened another terminal but then I'm on the same machine so that's cheating really um, you can use SSH from the terminal now having done that what I do now is open it now the first time you do that it will ask you this message about keys you need to accept that and what I don't like about that is it's too small I can't see it so what I'm going to do instead is kill that go back to putty load mint and change its font change the font there and go down here what I decided to use was monospace and I picked on 12 and said OK now if you go away if you cancel that it doesn't work what you have to do or open it there it'll open it and that font size but it won't save it what you do is you go back to the session there and you save it now to get to the mint machine with that IP address you just double click on mint and you log in as what should we be we can be train one with a password of X there we are in train one now we'll move that over there uh, that's not going to work is it I'll tell you what we'll do we'll shrink this up here and we'll put putty down there pretty isn't it I do love a dark theme right so there we are in train in case you forget we're in train one so back to the notes oh that wasn't very clever shrunk the wrong thing I should have shrunk that there it is there's train A underneath down there that'll do right and there's this one up here um, here so I need to go back to my KDM terminal and we'll look at the notes now this section looks at writing messages sending messages to other users if a user's logged on you can write to them they can find out if they're logged on with who command there we are train one is logged on as well as KDM so I can write to train one I can say write a message to train one and up down here comes message from KDM and you say good morning 
And when you press return at the top there, the message comes out at the bottom. At the top, to finish it, what you do is you send an end of data with control and D. So you can send more messages. I can say meeting is at 3 p.m. Something like that. Press return again. Gets that message. And when pressing control and D there, that sends an end of file. Down here, he just presses return and he's out. Now, it can be quite annoying if you're doing things like using Vine. People do this. So let me show you if I put, let's put Putty back up there. Let's edit a file like um, password. So in Vim, we'll edit password. So here I am happily heading password. I've got to this point here and I'm inserting um, a new line. New line here. When somebody sends me a message over here, I write to train one, say hello there. And of course what happens is all this message from hello there all pops up in the middle of my edit. Now what you do to solve that is apart from telling KDM to stop sending you messages, I remember someone constantly sending me messages once and I had to turn it off, which you can do. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Um, let's end, no, let's not end the message. Over here, um, what you do is you press escape. Actually, I'm not sure you even have to press escape. You can use control and L. Mm, no, we should press escape first. <laughs> press escape and use control and L. Control and L redraws the screen and then you're back where you were. No harm done. Whoops. Sorry. All right, we'll put that back down there. So, uh, what is being sent doesn't affect, i just come out of the edit there, doesn't affect what's going on on the user's terminal. It's separate. There I can do a control and D and then the file pops up down here. If you don't want messages sent to you, look at the MESG setting. MESG, if it returns Y, then someone can write to you. Set it to no with MESGN and that turns it off. So if MESG returns N, it's off. So up here, if I write to train one, it's not allowed. And that's how you disable it. That's how you send messages to other people. If I turn the message back on again, you can actually use redirection with messages. Now we did things like find, la, 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 redirect the output, remember? Append the output with two greater than. You can also use less than and two less than. So the way you might do that is if you wanted to write to train one and send him a message, you lose less than to redirect input into the command. And in SCR, there's a simple file called message and that gets sent to the user down here. That's there. You can also, if you think he won't notice that, uh, you can send him a message using figlet and to do that use a pipe. So go to this end and do figlet a message wake up exclamation mark and pipe it into write and that comes up down here and you'll probably notice so there's redirection and there's pipe interesting you can also pipe mail 
to mail. So if you wanted to send a sort message to several users, you can pipe hello there. I don't think you write to several users at once, but you can mail several users at once like that. Right, we'll, um, I think we're done with putty for the moment. So we'll quit from there. And stretch this back down again. What we stretched there, it didn't look like the right thing, did it? What's going on? Huh? Where was that? Oh, there we go. Sometimes it takes a while to recover to where we were. Right, what we'll look at next is some find examples just a few more things in this section we've done all the uh, all the important bits um, more examples of find here you can find my user looking for user train one and executing ls minus l by permissions by type directory or file by size bigger than 12 megabytes smaller than 12 megabytes and you can combine options with minus a and minus o but you have to bracket things and you have to escape the bracket with the backslash it does work though um, there's also another thing you can use to find files locate files called locate this is good but it's not as flexible as file you can't find files with locate and delete them, for instance. Locate should be there. And so you've got to tell it what to look for. Um, I don't think I have a readme file. I could tell it to locate by. And it's found that. And all the other occurrences are by um, in the home directory, which is neat. If locate doesn't work, you need to update the locate database like that. And sudo update the database. Um, common options with the command are suppress error messages, case insensitive search, limit the number of results returned. So for instance, if I do locate minus i, which is often case insensitive, it finds by in uppercase and lowercase. Um, curly brackets are useful if you want to do things to multiple users. For instance, here I'm mailing several users. Now see how it works. If I run that echo one two red blue and put them in curly braces they're comma separated so comma separated in curly braces what it does it appends fish to each of them so you get one fish two fish red fish blue fish put fish at the front you would get fish one fish two fish red fish blue now you can use this um, to send messages for instance, like that, that will send emails to all four users, train one, train two, train eight, and train X. And you can see what it does if you do set of minus X, we did this earlier, uh, which turns on the sort of debugging feature. It shows you what it does, it's mailing train one, train two, train eight, train X, sending them that message. If you remember, you turn set minus x off with set plus x. There we go. Um, what else? Um, when I'm in the classroom, a lot of this stuff at the end I do if there's time. Um, so I don't often cover them. Uh, you can use at to send messages. Check what the time is. And you could say at noon, for instance. Oh, I don't have the app command installed. 
Uh, if you wanted the app command, you would do sudo uh, apt install at uh, give it the password. It's very difficult to remember all the things you need to have. Um, they're all there in CentOS, but if you're using Mint or Ubuntu, it's taken me a while to set them up. So that will go through and install the package for me. And then you can say at a certain time you get the at prompt. And then the at prompt you decide what you want to send. So I can say at noon. Oh, it's going to be executed in bin sh, which is fine. Um, I could run that command there. I'll cheat and copy it. Don't copy too many commands because you learn them. If you type them in, you won't learn them if you keep copying things. <coughs> and then to finish it, Control and D. Then you're out. And I think you can do at minus L. And it will show you what's going to run at 12. It can't actually see what's going to run. Uh, and at minus R will remove it. Oh, I thought it did. Obviously it doesn't. Never mind, it's a one-off. It will run at 12 o'clock and that will be the end of it. And the last thing in here, I think, is the print system. The print system on uh, Linux uses something called cups. Again, we can do a PS minus EF and pipe it into grep cups. And there's the cups demon there, cups browse, whatever that is. And there are um, several commands you can use. <laughs> System 5 release 4 was a version of Unix. There were two versions of Unix split out after the 60s. BSD was the other one. And they each came up with different ways of doing printing or different commands. LPstat and LPQ show you the queue, LP and LPR do printing, and cancel and LPRM do cancelling. And then it supports both. So, um, here I can do an LP stat minus T, and look at the print queue, which is the same as doing an LP queue, basically. I tend to use the first ones. LP stat LP. I know we haven't got a printer connected to this virtual box, but you can just kid um, Linux that or Unix that there is a printer and just send it to a screen and set that up with um, LP admin, which I'll cover on the admin course I'm going to do. Uh, Now, as it says here, the print command simply send a stream of characters to the printer, much as the cat command does. A better approach is to make use of the command PR to format the string for printing. So you can use PR with minus D to double space the output. Um, you can give it a page length. You can use minus O. So for instance here, uh, if I cat Linux, it just scrolls across the page. But if I use PR Linux, whoops, and pipe it into less, uh, not very successful, was it? That's oh, because I can't spell PR. There we go. You get the date and time, you get the title, and you get the page numbers. That's the idea. I mean, obviously, if you've got a formatted document in pages that's come from something like LibreOffice, you wouldn't need this. But for text, you can do that, and then you can PR the file and just pipe it into print. Now, to print, you can use LP or LPR. So here's some examples here of printing. So... I said LP stat, I'm not going to dwell on this, 
minus T. I mean, that shows you prints for your user. Minus T shows you um, prints for everybody. Um, you could print something. So I could say PR Linux and pipe it into, I can't spell Linux, pipe that into LP and then run LP stat. And then I've got a print waiting. The reason it stays there is printing is disabled. If I didn't disable printing, it would just disappear down a black hole, whether this uh, this terminal uh, existed or not. You can actually get them to display on that terminal. But I wanted to illustrate how you could um, print them and delete them, so I disable printing. Um, to print as a default printer or to a different printer, uh, you can use minus DLP. And then when you print your jobs, if you don't want them, you can cancel them. So I can say cancel LP-3 and that will print that job. And it's gone. And it doesn't matter which set of commands you use or you can mix them if you want to. There are the others, LPQ, LPR and LPRM. It's the same sort of thing. Uh, one last page here. The no hup command, uh, no hang up, can be used to keep background processes running even if the original login is terminated. So any output from the command is directed to a file rather than to the terminal. So you say no hup, find whatever. So if I run that, it creates, I think, a file called nohup.out. There we go. Ignoring input and appending output to nohup.out. So that will run in background. I don't suppose it will take long. And it will produce a file called there it's finished, called nohup.out. And the idea is you can log out while that's going. The other one is not a lot of use to ordinary users. It's the nice command. The nice command alters the priority of a command. The problem is, unless you're root, you can only make your commands run more slowly. So the way it works is you put nice and a minus number in front of the command that you want to run. And this adds minus 10 to the default priority, which decreases the priority. The super user can increase the priority using the syntax below with a double hyphen, minus minus 10, i.e. add 10. But ordinary users can't do that. And the last thing here, is what's called a here file. Uh, we've seen redirection with a greater than, with two greater thans. We've seen two less thans, sorry, less than to redirect into the right command. This is two less thans. And what this does, it writes to train one. Um, I open train one again, haven't I? So if I go back down here, and I open Mint and I log in as train 1 again. I log in as train A last time, I can't remember. Train 1. There we go. Um, so what this does, stick that up there for now. What this says is write to train 1, read what follows on the command line until you hit the string EOF and you can use any terminator it doesn't have to be NOF it could be TRM term so if I copy that copy put 
put this back over here and paste it in here what hopefully it will do it will write that string to train one bingo it's magic isn't it there you go and that's called a here file and we'll come out of there um, you can use it for editing actually you can pass edit commands to an edit for a file and have it in there so that causes redirection of input up to the marker the EOF but it doesn't have to be F pending a minus file sign as in less and less than minus EOF has the effect that leading tabs are ignored it says variables and commands are evaluated this can be disabled by quoting it put those in single quotes it's just there of interest and then the last thing in this section are cron tab examples so 2 a.m. daily twice a day every minute um, a particular time every 10 minutes uh, selected months selected days first Sunday of the month every four hours uh, Sunday and Monday every 30 seconds etc and I think at the bottom it shows you how to save the cron I have to take a backup of the cron and then how to restore the cron from a text file which I covered earlier anyway right and that's the end that was quite a long section wasn't it So just to finish we'll go back to the slides um, and that was finding job control and the next one next week will be grep and sort and a few other things the ad hoc ones I have done uh, recover a lost password but I haven't posted it yet next week I hope to do installing arch the hard and the easy way um, I'm banging my head on the brick wall here because nobody's responding really. I get a few comments, but that's all. What's going on? There we go. But it would help me and I'll be more inclined to do another course if I get uh, more likes and comments, any recommendations, any feedback or questions, and even um, a coffee. Um, I'm getting lots of subscribes but very little else very little feedback you obviously want everything for nothing uh, never mind we'll see uh, so until next time grep and sort bye bye <laughs>